Hi. So just for an introduction, uh, many of you might not actually know me. Uh, I'm a former professional golfer. And uh, now I teach a few kids uh, and hopefully help them becoming in champions. Uh, the idea of today's talk is really stemming from the fact uh, for me that we need a cusp. We need a mix of things when it comes to teaching. Uh, teaching cannot only be dealt with in one form, which is in terms of a swing technique. I think we need to look at making a champion or a winner into a more holistic fashion. Uh, and that's really what I want to address today. I want to use both the experiences that I've had as a player, which has definitely been longer than what I've had as a coach. But uh, the idea is to use my experiences from my past to actually become a better teacher today and to actually help someone holistically uh, transform themselves into a champion. And, uh, you know, th this thing comes from one... Uh, one, one of the few thoughts that I get every now and then, and that is really uh, to do with why are there so many winners and why do their swings look different, right? Um, why is it that every champion from the past and every champion even of today has spoken about discipline, things like abstinence, they have spoken about things like sacrifices, um, you know, why uh, don't we speak more about this? And why do we leave uh, the instinct of a sportsman away from everything else, you know? Um, and I think that, that golf technique as such misses out on the most important aspect, which is someone's natural ability to hit a golf ball. Um, and I think the, the one thing that will really hold you well in the future when you're especially under an under pressure situation is the feel factor. And the feel factor really is coming to you from a place where you honed something over a period of time and it's, uh, it's something that you can revisit later under a situation of pressure. It is something that you can think of. It is an instinct of yours. Um, also, you will see that a lot of sports psychologists do speak about instincts quite a bit. They say that you, know, you should always follow your gut. And when you speak about such things, I think one thing that we are not really focusing on over here is why are they saying these things? And there's a reason why this happens, that why a Sachin Tendulkar has been a great batsman and has had a separate technique from what a Virendra Seva or a Don Bradman has had. And similarly today, a Yuvraj Singh or a Shikhar Dhawan, everyone's technique looks very, very different. And so does MS Dhoni's. You cannot take away greatness from any of these players. You can't take away greatness from a Jim Milka Singh or a Jim Furyk. And all of these people have had something in common, which is wins on tour. They have all performed under pressure. And that exactly is what is going to make you a champion. And I see that we as coaches also, and I'm, I'm taking myself into account over here, that we do um, make mistakes. We do speak about technique a little too often sometimes. And I think we have to be more cognizant of the fact that just technique is not going to make someone win a tournament or become a great player in the future. Uh, I would say that in the past, I have not only been prey to something like this, I, uh, I can also confess today that, that sometimes I have also made this mistake as a coach think that that technique is extremely, extremely important. So I want to tell you all one very simple thing that technique is important. No one's getting that out of the window, but how important is it? Um, I would say that yes, to learn to hit the golf ball well, you need technique as much as you need uh, very personal instincts to do so. The other thing that we are not looking at is which is probably 70% of the game is strategy. We need to look at the mental ability of a person. We need to look at what kind of distractions we get into. And things like these are what are going to actually shape you as a player. What's not the only thing, if we just keep speaking about technique, 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 and the swing should be, you know, this way we, we should make this position and that position is uh, if that were true, then Matthew Wolf wouldn't be really uh, doing very well, wasn't it? And uh, Jim Furyk wouldn't be doing that well. 
and uh, because these people do not look textbook and textbook does not necessarily win tournaments i know hundreds of players who've got great golf swings if you look at them on the driving range you'd be like whoa man i've never seen something like that ever in my life and um, their scorecards probably reflect a 74 or a 78 um i think there's there's voice breaking happening um is it better now uh, no, sir, your voice is fine. Uh, those who are facing audio issues, please click on your mic button or uh, kindly check your internet. Your voice is fine, sir. You can continue. Okay. okay. So um, what we are missing out on is really the, the rest of the 70% of the game, wherein if all these people can swing differently and still win on the PGA Tour or the European Tour or the Japanese Tour or many other majors for that example, um, why aren't we talking enough about how mentally strong you have to be as a champion? And that is something that I want to address today. That is one. And the other thing that I will be touching upon a little bit is when should a child, a child be getting into um, really specific golf training? So when we talk about things like, you know, working on swing mechanics and all that, I personally, as a coach, uh, up to the age of 12, do not like to touch upon uh, highly swing technicalities. I would rather give them some basics, uh, teach them the stance. I would give them a few visualizations. And I would actually uh, make them into people who definitely enjoy the sport a lot. And they really want to smack that ball as much as possible. Um, I would really take it from, from that angle instead of, you know, jumping it around and straight away putting a small nine-year-old kid into technique. Because I think what we, what we have cut over there is the child's natural instinct. And if the child's natural instinct is taken away, then we are really um, in doom's land because that child will not know how to perform under pressure because that is his fallback. His fallback is his natural instinct or her natural instinct. In fact, um, I just came across um, a quote this morning uh, which Arnold Palmer's father told him when he went to play his first PGA Tour event. He told him, if you listen to any of the coaches out there, the tractor will be outside waiting for you. I mean, that really uh, goes on to show, and we all know Arnold Palmer's career. He's a legend. And, uh, you know, and, and things like these have really been left out. So we need technique, no denying that. But how much is too much? And the old uh, adage of you know, paralysis by analysis is something that I think we suffer even more today. We have spoken about this, uh, you know, these, these three words over the last 10, 15 years so much, but we have still not smartened up enough to understand that how much paralysis by analysis we coaches uh, end up causing. And I am actually putting myself into the same bracket because we can be at fault. Uh, we do make these errors. And uh, for kids, we should be extremely, extremely careful when we do so. I actually want to also take in a few anecdotes from my own playing career, uh, wherein I have uh, not only uh, I've played well in parts, I've not done so well in parts, I've had my own ups and downs, and there have been a variety of reasons for it. And uh, most, of the re most of the time, the reason I can tell you has been bad advice. Uh, my own uh, judgment of the advice wasn't that good on most occasions. I did not have the sort of intelligence that was needed at the time. So all these things all together uh, have, have led to a, a certain different things today. And I'm glad that today I can actually look back on those days and learn from it and move on to actually become a better coach and teach kids out of my own experiences, my own mistakes as to what can work and what cannot work. Um, there is no one size fits all. There is no one coach that is great. We should all remember that. Um, we should also all remember that if the child has enough faith and keeps enjoying the sport the way they do, more often than not, even if they do not become champions, I'll tell you one thing, that sports ends up teaching us a lot of discipline, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of hard work. And when your child knows all these things, uh, whether the child becomes a champion in golf or not, 
that child will surely become a champion in his life or her life in something or the other, whatever they choose to do in the future. Another, um, another thing that comes to my mind right now is that when a lot of parents come to me with their kids who are uh, probably at the age of around 10 to 12 or maybe 10 to 13, um, they say, do you think my child has talent? And do you think my child can, can be a top PGA to a player? Uh, to be very honest, there is no answer to this question. Uh, we will not know until your child actually becomes a PGA to a player. There is no, you know, there is no tonic that we can mix up and, you know, we can check uh, or make them a PGA to a player. It is all based on their own interpretations, their own hard work, their own mindfulness, their own awareness. Um, a lot of things will come into perspective over here. So whether or not they can become a champion at the age of 12 or 13 in their own category, yes, we, we can definitely tell you one thing. If your child has the general ability to be able to hit a golf ball, okay, I can tell you that much. But whether I can tell you that your child at the age of 25 is going to be on the PGA Tour or not, um, I'm sorry, but I don't think any coach really has that uh, capability or that foresight uh, to themselves. Uh, we will only come to know as time moves on. So having said that, you know, so this is the kind of drift that I'm really coming from over here today. I am a swing coach. I do teach technique. I also, uh, you know, approach my students from a variety of different angles. I like to look at them from uh, a personality perspective. I, I think it's again breaking up. Uh, it? No, sir, it's fine, sir. It's fine? Okay. Yeah. So I like to look at these kids from a variety of different perspectives, what age they are in. Um, what do they want to do? Do they actually want to become a professional or not? And is that thing coming from within or is it coming from without? And when I say without, um, I mean a parent or a friend or a peer pressure. So I, I like to know all these things because that is really going to make me design the way I am going to teach this child. Um, also, let's say if a, if a better player comes to me and sometimes they do like at the age of sometimes at 16, sometimes at 19, I'm really trying to get to know them as uh, number one in terms of what they've learned so far, that would be a very important aspect to know uh, because I don't want to contradict someone's teaching. And, and to be honest, everyone's teaching is fairly similar. What is different though over there is that we are looking at both things from a perspective, a different perspective. So I could be teaching you one thing coming in from one angle and I would achieve one certain thing. And similarly, another coach also might come in and attack the same problem and get to the same uh, solution, but in a different way. So I want to know what these kids have learned so that we can actually talk conceptually uh, as to what they think about the golf swing and what they think about the game of golf and how we can actually, you know, see where are the gaps over there, see what are they thinking, uh, are they fearing something, are they, are they pushing themselves harder than they need to, or are they not pushing themselves at all? and a variety of things that come into the picture over here. I've also had kids who try to believe that, that you know, if you put in one hour during my lesson, you don't need to practice after that. Um, see, that lesson really is me talking to you, reading you, analyzing the swing, giving you a solution after talking to you about it. We try usually two to three different permutation combinations, um, and that is essentially pretty much everyone. Uh, we will try to find which is the best solution that works for you. But the solution isn't set yet inside you because habitually you're used to doing something else. So a one hour lesson, I would say, needs to be followed up with about six hours of practice. Um, I mean, a bare minimum of four hours of practice, I would say. And maybe not immediately, but maybe over the next three days. Uh, we really need to see, have, have things really settled in or not. Uh, Come to think about it, if I put you in, a, in the habit that you're in right now of the lockdown, where you do not wake up on time, you do not sleep on time, you follow a routine where you, you know, probably watch a little bit too much of Netflix. Uh, if I suddenly, when I pull, pull you out of this lockdown, you're going to be thrown off. Okay. Now, suddenly you have to wake up at 6 a.m. You must leave home by 8 o'clock for your office or the golf course. And then you have to work all day long and suddenly you're going to be all thrown off. So what we have to remember over here is that if I tell you something or if any coach tells you something, 
you must first make your own judgment if that is something that sticks with your head because that is the only way that you are going to start working hard on it there is no other way for you to work hard on anything unless and until you are sure that what we have spoken about and the the solutions that we have reached um, are going to be helpful to you or not faith in the coach is something that is extremely extremely important it really does not matter uh, what kind of a category of a coach you're going to but if you have faith in your coach i can certainly tell you you will achieve way more than going to an expensive coach and not having faith over there so you know and all these aspects need to come together when we speak about teaching as such holistically i would say from a home perspective we need to work on things like you know support and the support really is not i would say it is a uh, be there for your child when they do well and when they don't do well you do not need to pick them up and put them on a pedestal the day they do well and the day they don't do well you don't talk to them and i have had students like that where this is something that they have suffered with their parents and you know that is uh, so sad for a child who's 15 years old to not have their father speak to them for a week if they did not perform well in a tournament visibly uh, when that same child wins a tournament and comes back that father is showering them with you know apple products for example so you know uh, this is a great way to break a child's uh, confidence for instance so it's a long journey when you talk about a kid who is let's say 10 years old uh, wanting to tread the path of professional golf it's a very very long path and that path i think should be um, dealt with very um, slowly and softly i would say like a turtle uh, don't be lazy about it but keep walking on that path keep walking on that path don't be a snare don't try to run on that path because uh, running is not really going to get you there it's a very slow process small incremental steps towards your goal will get you there for sure uh even if they don't like i said earlier you will learn so much on the way that no matter what you do you will end up coming out as a winner even if you let's say you end up becoming an mba later on you would still do well in that because you've learned the uh the essence of hard work so one of my friends earlier and i just remembered him he uh, runs a marketing company and he told me one time he said if you have a friend who has been into sports wants to join a marketing firm i said why would you want a sportsman into a marketing firm he said you know the thing is that sportsmen know how to do hard work they know how to be disciplined they know how to sacrifice things so these are the kind of qualities i want in the person that works in my company and you know and it was such a uh, refreshing change to actually hear this because mostly you would never hear something like this you would hear that now uh, a person in the marketing firm must be a marketing graduate or a marketing mba and this was uh, something completely different and come to think about it everybody each one of you who succeeded in life have these qualities you weren't given anything on the platter and neither should your child be and uh, i think that's the biggest learning that sports gives us and uh, so when i when i look at a when i look at a you know a, a child who's probably reached a four handicap or a six handicap we are looking at them very very differently in terms of their development as a sportsman uh, we are looking at a very uh, very serious kind of practice routine we are looking at a very serious hard work kind of a disciplinary routine because at the end of the day if i don't inculcate these things in them today what will happen is that when they come to a tournament they will fall apart because they will have to be on the tee on time just the very smallest example uh, they must go back uh, to their rooms in the afternoon and check what have they done wrong in the day so that they can go back to the range and practice in the evening so all these things to be able to put all these things into perspective we have to start this at a very early age uh, i personally very honestly did not start all these things at a at an early age and i think that could be a very uh, important uh, aspect of why i um you know had also suffered a lot of ups and downs and i wish i i did have some better guidance along the path uh, so that i could design my journey a lot better but having said that um we are here now and let's see uh, how we can best help you all out as parents as as children or as an aspiring golfer uh, to best get on this path in a in a much more positive fashion um 
So let's get on. Uh, I think see how we can we can start off with some questions because I think we can make this into more of an interaction and get on with it here on. All right, sir. We have few questions, so I'll just read it out to them. Yeah. Uh, as a parent, how many tournaments uh, should my son of fifteen years play? Okay, so um, I think the first most important thing over here is you want to look at how uh, how good your child is right now. Okay, um, are they really doing well? Uh, are they really working hard on their game? or not working hard on their game. So we, we should first take into aspect these things. And the other thing that we will take into aspect over here is how much time do they spend studying? What kind of a school routine do they have? Because schooling is very important. Let's not deny that. It is a very, very important aspect in making a, an, an all-round personality for your child. Um, and it will benefit them even in the future. So um, if I were to just take a 15-year-old kid, this kid is probably in 10th standard right now. So a child in 10th standard has got boards, uh, enough amount of studies and tuitions. All these things taken together, now you have to also put in the golf time. I would uh, strongly suggest at this age, uh, you should focus on tournaments which happen near your home, which are basically tournaments. Uh, like let's say I live in Noida, so I would suggest take tournament, look at tournaments in the Delhi NCR. So... Let's say if you live down south, maybe you, you should only look at those southern area tournaments. So that could be your private tours and the feeder tours. And when you look at the main tour, uh, if your child, your child should only play the national events uh, or an international event that they get to play as a part of the Indian team. You don't need to fly them there to play international tournaments at this age. So I, I would definitely suggest you plan it out in this fashion. You don't need to play anything and everything. You must map it out because you have to understand that the child also needs rest. The child's brain also needs rest. If we put too much on them straight away, they will get burnt out much quicker than is expected. All right, sir. The next question is from a girl of uh, age 13. Uh, she has been in like playing golf for four years, but her score is still really bad as it's uh, 13, 14, 15 overs. So as you're a coach, and a sports counselor. So, can you help her cure? Where she is going question for you once again. She's a she's of age thirteen. Yeah, she is uh, of age thirteen, and she has been playing golf for four years. Okay. But her score is still uh, not improving. It's still like 13, 14, 15 overs. So, so if can, you can help her, can she tell us that is it her ball striking ability, or is it her short game, or is it her scoring? Which of the three things? does she feel that she suffers uh, the problem with most? Uh, scoring, she has right. answered. So, yeah. And if I were to just ask uh, you, Lavanya, uh, whether you spend more time on the driving range or you spend more time playing a round of golf? Sorry, guys, for whoever is waiting, because I am uh, just trying to get the full answer. Uh, what all do you spend most time in? Uh, do you spend it playing on the golf course, or do you spend most of your time on the golf course practicing on a driving range? Because when it comes to scoring, my first thought process runs to um, you haven't been going to the course and playing enough, right? So... I would actually suggest that you should cut down your practicing time if you're happy with your ball striking ability uh, to maybe 25% of the time. And I would spend 75% of the time just playing on the golf course. And these could be with completely random people. You know, as a child, I used to really enjoy playing with some old uncles and all. And I really remember that time because there were some old uncles that I used to play with, some 70-year-old uncles also, who used to hit a driver on a 180-yard path three and they used to drop it and stop it on the green. So, you know, it, it, you get to learn also a lot from these people. So I would definitely suggest just go out and spend most of your time playing a round of golf and you will find your way. If you don't find your way, you can email me or you can uh, you, you can email me or call me. I'm sure the CR will be able to help you with that. And I will I can help you out in charting out how exactly you can work on improving your rounds. Uh, you should do a little bit of statistical analysis on your fairways hit greens in regulation uh, and the number of parts you've taken and the number of up and downs you make. 
And uh, what I'll do is I will put up a, uh, a snippet of how I like to look at stats on my Instagram page, and you can have a look at that. Maybe you can check that out, make your statistics that way, and see uh, in, which is the area that you need to focus on more when you go to the practice area, and which is the area that you have been neglecting the most. And I'm guessing the most area neglected right now, which I've seen a lot in, in my club as well, is uh, going on the course and actually playing around a golf. It is so important to play around a golf that I, I mean, I cannot even stop emphasizing on it. Just pick up your bag and go play on your own. You will learn the most amount about, about golf from there, not from any lesson. All right, so then moving on to the next question. Uh, regarding keeping to walk on the path towards the goal, balancing studies with golf is a big dilemma nowadays. So how can we give importance to both and which should be emphasized more? So I definitely think that we should be looking at both the aspects. There is, the, you cannot look at golf in, in one fashion and you cannot look at the rest of your life in another fashion. Uh, if you want to be a true athlete and you can go back in history and you can ask um, many, uh, you, you can check history of many golfers or many other sportsmen for that matter, you will notice that everybody, one thing they've done well is they have time managed themselves in a great fashion. And in, at, a, at a younger age, I would say your time management does not only need studies in golf, it needs studies, golf, time with friends, playing other sports, doing your homework, spending time with family. So when you look at 24 hours, I suggest you break these down. You take away six for sleep because six is a good amount of sleep that you can have. Now you're left with 18 hours. I think most of the kids are spending about seven to eight hours in schools these days. So we've already taken out 14 hours from the day. You're left with 10 hours. In those 10 hours, I'm pretty sure you need to rest, chill, eat food, uh, I'd say we can take away two hours for all those activities. Now, whatever we are left with, we must break it down positively between homework as well as golf and one more other sport. And I highly suggest another sport as at a young age because athletic ability is something that we forget. Um, golf does not give you a lot of athletic ability. I might get bashed up a little bit uh, for saying this, but it does not give you athletic ability as such. So we must must um, make sure that we do things like, you know, maybe do some athletics for that matter, maybe do some, play some football for that matter. I suggest a lot of my students to, you know, go and learn karate or taekwondo, by the way, or kickboxing, Muay Thai. I like to uh, give them these because it teaches them a lot of coordination. It gives them a lot of killer instinct. And all these aspects are very important in becoming a professional sportsman at any level. All right, so then moving on to the next question. Uh, what are the biggest differences between an elite amateur and a tour professional? How big is the gap really, do you think? Um, so I'll, I, I, I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I will give this question a little bit of a twist. Uh, just because you're an elite amateur should not mean, cannot mean that you will be a tour professional. Okay, let's just take this um, a notch higher and look, break it down in your scoring patterns. And we should understand one thing that to be uh, an elite professional golfer, you need a scoring average of 71, 70, 69. You know, you need those kind of scoring averages. You need even lower than that if you can go lower than that. If you're around 68, you'd probably be number one in the world. So we need to look at the scoring averages to see where you stand today and how far you need to get. Just being an elite amateur does not mean you can be a tour professional and definitely does not mean that you can be a good tour professional. The, your real sense will come from the scoring averages of tournaments. It does not mean anything if you're an elite amateur. All right. Uh, so how can we play consistent uh, golf for four days uh, for amateur players? Okay. So... I would. Uh, I, I used to do something as a kid myself. I used to pick up my bag and play on my own some days, and some days with my friends. You know, a couple of small bets. Maybe it could be to do with a fresh lime or a lunch bet. And what we used to do was, I used to play four rounds in a row. So I used to see my patterns over there and see how I was scoring in all the four rounds. And it used to. It. It. Of course, it's not exactly how a tournament is but it definitely helps you a lot in sort of 
putting your stamina into perspective. Your, and by stamina, I mean mental stamina. Because you have to go day after day, no matter how you played the previous day, go into scoring better the next day. And if it doesn't work, then you still try the next day. And that is essentially uh, the way I used to work on it. I used to also try another technique sometimes to better my scoring, which was um, when I just about started, you know, getting to single figures. Now, breaking it down further on was becoming difficult for me. So this was when I was, I think, an eight handicapper. So what I started doing was I started breaking my 18 hole rounds into six hole rounds. And in those six hole rounds, I used to aim at shooting one over uh, per six holes to take it a notch further. And uh, that used to help me in my scoring patterns. So I used to play four, four rounds on my own with my friends or on my own. And thereafter, take those rounds and break them down thereafter to make them into better rounds. Uh, of course, within a tournament, there are many other aspects that come into perspective, but the work starts in practice. The work does not start in tournament. So the tournament is only really a stage that you're getting, but the backstage work is what is happening in your golf course at your home club. And that's what you should focus on most. I would uh, highly suggest that you start focusing on reducing your scores uh, one by one. Do not try to jump from a 10 to a 2. Uh, you, you can try to go from a 10 to an 8. But you should try to break your scores down slowly and steadily instead of jumping the gun straight away. And the same thing, uh, break down your statistics. They will give you a realistic figure on the things you need to work on. And you can also judge a lot of your mental ability just by your statistics. It does not only show you about, um, so let's say I'm consistently missing an up and down from you know 20 yards. So if I'm consistently missing an up and down from 20 yards, means that I should work on that aspect of the game. And these are the things that will really come together uh, to make you a better player for four days. Definitely one thing that I think is not spoken about enough is to meditate. You must meditate and center your mind before you play a round of golf. You must also center yourself before you enter a tournament. You have to do these things just so that, you know, you, you need to be mentally in a very calm space when you're going out to play golf. There have been players uh, in the past who have done well, uh, who haven't been, you know, very calm characters. But uh, most of the guys whom you will see who have done exceedingly well for a longer duration of time have been very, very cool and calm characters in golf. And uh, that is something that we must take into account when we're looking at a four-day performance. A four-day performance really has to be looked at as a marathon. It should not be looked at as a sprint. All right. Uh, so we have a question from YouTube. How to develop faith on a coach when there are so many? Um, uh, this is a very, very good question. So it's a difficult thing to do. Uh, what you have to do is you have to just rely on your own um, you know, like when we, when we meet people and uh, when they speak to us, it gives you a bit of energy. And I would really, I, I personally believe in a lot of energy and vibe and all that. So I would really go a lot with that. So if someone is giving me some positive uh, stuff, uh, you know, when I meet them, I would really look at that. So trusting a coach is a million dollar question. I think it would be dependent on the rapport the student builds with the coach or the coach builds with the student. Uh, it has to be a both way traffic. It should be encouraged by a lot of question answers. So you as a student should be free to, to question the student a lot. And the student also must be free to ask you a lot of questions back in uh, uh, return. And uh, there should be no problem as such in terms of uh, you know, uh, communicating all this. Uh, the coach should be free to speak and ask and so should the student be. And I think that will build some faith into this whole equation. You can also check uh, how invested your coach is uh, in your goals, vis-a-vis -vis their chat with you and all of that. And, and that will really help you in assessing the kind of situation that you're in. How much time do they spend? Are they empathetic towards you? And I would think of empathy as a very, very important aspect. Um, in, in coaching because each kid is very, very different. Very, very different. I could, you know, I, I can tell you that every kid has a very different ability of learning. And I have learned all this just over the past couple of years. And it's, it's been a tremendous learning for me as well. 
All right. So the next question: How can we play consistent? Uh, sorry. How can we improve scoring and break seventy six? What kind of a practice routine would you recommend? Okay. Uh, so, firstly, definitely, uh, I would structure my. Uh, I would go back into scoring again, as to what are the hindrances and which are the parts of the game that are really lacking. Uh, especially those four parts that I spoke about, which is long game, short game, uh, the putting, and the the score in the end. So. i will look at all the aspects separately and see where is it that the lack is uh, happening and i would spend my majority of time firstly in honing those skills then i would uh, definitely look at many other aspects in terms of which are the kind of parts i miss most and that could be a detailed version of your statistic um i would go into that then i would do a couple of other things which are uh, play the worst ball okay it's a great drill it's easily available online you you can search it online if you like um the worst ball basically is that when you're standing on the first tee box go alone in the afternoon or something on your golf course whenever it's free hit two shots and the worst ball is the one that you're going to play out that and then from the worst ball you hit another two balls and then again you choose the worst ball to play and this i've found to be an a very very interesting uh, activity to do it's extremely frustrating in the beginning you'd be lucky if you probably shoot nine over for nine holes it's a uh, it's very very difficult to do in the beginning but you will see the more you do it the better you will get at it and then when i send you on the golf course to play with one ball you will suddenly see there'll be a paradigm shift uh, that has happened in your brain because what has happened is that now you've learned how to deal with the bad situation because constantly you were dealing with the worst shots that you hit and i have found this to be an extremely helpful drill to go out and improve your scoring all right so next question so a parent has been asking my son 16 year old in class 12 has handicap index of plus 0.6 taking a call regarding college education and serious golf career is a challenge please advise um so i would actually try to get this answer from the child um how inclined is the child towards the sport of golf uh do they does he really want to does he or she really want to be a professional golfer and spend the rest of her life playing professional golf touring across the world and playing tournaments that is uh, something that will have to come from within the person uh it does not matter what the parent wants because at the end of the day the child has to be ready to do this kind of a work so if the child is ready i would definitely suggest that you do college education but you can probably do it locally instead of doing it internationally um uh, in the other sense i would also take into account that in case your child uh is getting college education abroad uh he or she will have to be really really a balanced individual because we have seen that international college education in the past has gone both ways one it has really taken off some people's careers and it has really taken down some other people's careers and when we talk about um, college education in the west it is a very positive thing only if your child knows how to deal with it positively because no matter it's like a it's like coaching right so no matter what i tell if you don't absorb it's not really going anywhere so similarly if your child knows how to stay balanced no matter what their handicap is no matter what ncaa championship they are playing no matter which college we have sent them to they could be in the best college with the best of distractions around them if they are smart and know how to stay centered they can deal with this and they can really benefit from college golf and that's something that comes from home really it's not something that will come from anywhere outside it's going to come from home the balanced atmosphere that you create over there All right. So the next question. Uh, hopefully, sir. Uh, the next question. Can you recommend uh, any scope for college golf in USA for Indian golfers? So, so this, I think I think it's a similar kind of a question. Uh, the scope of college golf in the USA is uh, huge. Having said that, there are people who benefited from it and who have not benefited from it. So that's a call that you will have to take, and it's similar to the question that we spoke about earlier. so you will have to take all those aspects into account before you make this decision to really go across to the states to play golf 
Uh, there are good colleges available over here as well. So you could also use them. Uh, although if your child is balanced and you can provide them a good atmosphere and they, they know how to stay mindful and aware at all times, what they, and they do not get easily distracted by things around them, you know, and that can be really a major thing out in the West. So if they don't, they could really use that NCAA experience as a springboard to straight away lob on to, let's say, uh, the PGA Tour or the European Tour. And that, that springboard can be very, very helpful. You could actually cut out a few steps of the way to the PGA Tour by being a good NCAA player. All right, sir. We don't have any more questions uh, right now. Lovely, lovely. So, uh, I yeah, there. Awesome. I think, uh, sir. I think we got one question. There are many apps to record golf stats, like Golf Pad, Up Game. Do you recommend any of them to record stats? So, I have personally not used any of these. Um, I definitely. I'm not sure if there is a need to go into a paid app system. Uh, I don't endorse any of these and neither will I. I have spoken to some of them in the past and I have felt that, you know, the regular way of uh, my student uh, keeping a pocket diary with them and writing down their statistics and revisiting them every now and then, I think is way more beneficial. Uh, I personally do not prefer a lot of smartphone reliance for a good player that I have because I want to actually send them away a little bit from this whole uh, social media stuff and the whole media stuff because they need to focus and this is really cutting out their time of practice. So I would rather have them write things down in a diary and make notes and revisit things instead of putting them down on an app. But that's my personal choice. Uh, I personally do not use any of these apps. All right. Uh, so you mentioned about eight hours left for golf and studies. So what kind of distribution is advisable for fitness and golf? Um, what would you recommend? Yeah. So how old is this child again once? This is the same child, uh, 16 years old in class okay. 12. Okay. So I would, I would suggest uh, about 30 to 45 minutes of uh, fitness work. And this could uh, be all kinds of random stuff alternated on different days with strength and conditioning, which could help you with your golf game. Uh, I would spend about two hours into practice and maybe another half an hour to one hour playing other sports or, you know, just maybe just chilling out with friends. Um, I think it's very important. Let's not cut it out of their lives. Um, you know, maybe just going around the apartment complex and going and uh, playing with friends. I mean, that could also be another, another thing to do. Uh, I'm sure two odd hours in the day would go into their homework and all that. So whatever we are left with, I'm happy with with about, we, we can do about three hours of golf in this. And for a 16-year-old child, while going to school, if they can give in three hours uh, to golf, while planning those three hours out, I think they can hugely benefit from it, hugely. All you have to do is plan those three hours well, and you will do well. I mean, you know, it's the old adage of, again, saying that that it's always quality over quantity and it's true so you can try it out give it about 15 20 days and uh, i would be very happy to hear uh, whether it helps you or it doesn't help you i mean i'm, I'm happy to hear it either way so do you recommend uh, this routine for all age aged teenagers like from 12 pretty much pretty much so i would say years, this yeah. kind of a routine should be uh, kept on for most of the kids who are playing playing as well as they are, uh, as well as they are studying in school because they need to balance things out. We can't be pushing them to the wall thereafter that I have seen kids who've been pushed so much to the wall that they stop playing golf. And I don't want to push any kid to that wall. They should be coming for a small time, enjoying themselves, put in quality work and then go back home and do their thing after that. Uh, so yes, mostly kids who are in school, I would definitely advocate something like this. Uh, instead of pushing them completely to the corner because then they'll be you know, burning the midnight oil to study and pass their exams the next day. So we must balance it out. All right. Uh, so what is the best way for a player to review his performance after a round in a tournament? Statistics. Statistics by far. Uh, also, what you can do with statistics is that uh, after you make your four rounds, you can also write down what you shot in all those rounds. And then after... 
you know, the next week and the week after that and the week after that. And it will be a very uh, important comparison to make that over time, what you learn from your statistics with a week, how your scores changed because of it, or if they did not change because of it. So I think that would be a very, very important thing to do in terms of actually doing a very long-term improvement in your scoring patterns. Uh, all right, so there's a question from YouTube. Uh, why is it advisable not to watch golf lessons online? <laughs> um, okay, so I think the answer is very, very simple in this. Uh, if I uh, start Googling symptoms of illnesses right now on Google, I will come up with a variety of different illnesses. And, you know, if you write fever or something on Google, you're, you're more likely, most likely to find some very, very uh, grave illnesses on, uh, on, on Google as of now. You can, you know, probably find cancer also as one of the things that you are going to be encountered with. So it's like that. Firstly, uh, we don't know how to decipher information yet. Do you know as a golfer, what is the information which is relevant to you and which is not relevant? So why are you taking an information which is not relevant to you? Because at the end of the day, that, that information is making an imprint on your mind and you will use that at some point of time to go and do the same thing on the practice tee. While that information was never meant for you either way. Then we go and watch YouTube lessons. The other thing that we do is we try things, we do things without understanding why they are being done. So let's say that I put up something on YouTube today and I say that this is a certain move and we should work on it in a certain fashion. But why is it that that move was being done in the first place? Maybe you weren't doing that move in the first place at all. So all this YouTube stuff, all it's going to do to you is give you paralysis by analysis. It is uh, a very, I would, I'd rather tell my students that if they're really spending time on YouTube, they should watch uh, old golf tournaments and see what players and how dif differently they end up winning tournaments. And that that's something that I find very, very interesting instead of watching lessons on YouTube. Uh, because they are quite repetitive, actually, if you have noticed. So I'd rather watch tournaments and see what kind of players, what kind of swings, what kind of rhythm, what kind of short games end up winning all tournaments rather than watching YouTube. All right. Uh, so what is the best way to practice golf in lockdown? Um, I would say do yoga practices, do a lot of meditation practices. If you can uh, work on the turning of your body, then you must work on the turning of your body at home uh, because that is something that will significantly help you when you get back there on the golf course. If there is something that you have been struggling to change, let's say a certain position, that is something that you can do in mirror practice right now because when you do not have the ball to tell you what kind of a trajectory it produced, that swing that you made, then it's much easier to make a change in, in this time. So you can use this time in these fashions. Uh, essentially, to my students, I have been uh, telling them to practice a lot of yoga, work out a lot, use, you know, uh, understand how the body needs to turn during the golf swing. And that's the only thing that I have been telling them to do, not any club work, really. All right. Uh, so how would you recommend a super senior to improve scoring and breaking 80? Oh, very difficult question. So it depends on what your handicap is right now, uh, how realistic your goal is, what are the kind of problems you face today. And your problems could really be quite simple, actually. It could be to do with strategy, if anything. So we need to look at a variety of aspects to see what are the actual problems. So is this from Mr. Arvind Sirohi? A question from Arvind Sirohi. My home course is nine hole with one par four and rest par three. How good is playing regularly on such a course? Uh, well, of course, you there is a you know certain limitation to such a course. Uh, the more you can venture out and play different golf courses, it would be nice for you. Also, what you can do is that. Um, you could also make your own golf course a little more interesting by just going out and playing with irons on some days. Uh, maybe just, you know, just leave the woods completely at home that day. Uh, you can take three clubs some days and just play with three clubs. And we used to do this when we were kids. We used to take seven iron pitching wedge and a putter. And just with these three clubs, we used to play 18 holes and see how well we fared. 
and uh, these are the various ways in which you can make the same golf course into a little more difficult golf course you can also play the worst ball drill and that could help you also to improve as a player while playing on a course like this so yes you can make the same course into a slightly difficult track by changing the equipment that you have by changing the situations that you create all right uh, so what are the aspects that should be in the table of stats that we should maintain okay so i keep a very uh, simple uh, setup of stats let me see if i can just draw this and show it to someone uh, straight away so so i like to put in whole numbers and i like to put in the par for the hole fairway green in regulation then i need to see if i made saves or not and putts and this is mostly how i like to design my stats and pretty much as simple as that if you guys can tell yeah so i have made different columns and we've got hole number we've got par of the hole we have uh, if you hit the fairway or not you hit the green or not uh if you didn't hit the green then did you make a save on it which means whether it's a bunker save or a chip and putt or a pitch and putt and then how many putts you made and um, i like to follow this simple grid all the time it's benefited me as a player as well and i continue to use it even with my students all right so the next question what should we think as players during pre shot routine and at address uh that's a, it's a very very good question actually um so when you're in the pre shot routine um i would be doing first thing that i would do is to look at what the ball how the lie of the ball is and the distance and you know all those things with the wind factor before i pick the club up once i pick the club up i'm going to be uh, starting to mostly starting to visualize sort of the shot you know so let's suppose i've got a 135 yard shot with a pin into the left front of the green and uh, my the wind's also coming in from the left side uh, so i'm actually going to be starting to visualize what kind of a shot can i play to actually get this ball as close to the hole as possible and my practice swing is sort of going to be uh, a mirror ima uh, an image of the the swing that i the shot that i aim to hit once i make those one or two practice swings i would give myself the line that i want to play on so let's say for this condition that i've just referred to i would take my line pretty much on the flag and hit it straight on to it so i will choose a point just in front of the ball and my only aim when i'm addressing the ball would be to align myself to that point that i've chosen give one or two looks to the target and shoot off um i will try to keep my mind as less from clutter as possible i would go mostly towards imagining the kind of shot that i want to hit i will be visualizing constantly that shot that i want to hit i would not be putting in too many thoughts yes if you have a certain swing thought you could have that and i would say the swing thought really you need to use in your uh, practice swing not so much in the main swing that you hit because the practice swing you're already reminding your body about those uh swing thoughts that you have once you're on the ball i prefer to use only ball and target as my two parameters to hit the ball all right so moving on to the next question some golf courses doesn't allow two balls so it is difficult to practice the word ball drill so right. is there any other drill you would recommend for scoring or improving the golf game right so so i could actually uh turn it the other way right so one thing is that you could uh once you're around the greens you can drop a ball in some difficult positions that could be one thing to do you could stymie the ball next to a tree that's something that you could do the other thing that you could also look at is to actually uh play with the three clubs so like i said that i used seven iron pitching wedge and the putter as the three clubs that i would play with similarly you could choose whichever three clubs from your golf bag and take those on with you and uh, the three club drill in itself is a very very uh, nice drill to go and learn scoring with uh, less amount of things in your bag and it will it will significantly improve your scoring skills and do let me know if it does uh, i'll be very very happy to hear either way like i said earlier 
so what advice do you wish to give to the parents who follow during the playing period of the, of the child till the child gets adult um i would say just be a watcher do not be an advisor do not be a coach just watch just be there um a smile every now and then can help your child at that time uh, no matter if they've done well or done badly uh, you should try to refrain from you know any sort of comparative analysis with another parent and seeing another child of another parent uh, you must try to stay level headed and calm your child is not going to be good at everything but yes they could be good at everything and they could be good at golf as well and we must uh, respect that fact and we must have that sort of empathy for children so you must you know your your job as a parent should be really to make sure that you are a looker from a distance if your child needs some water or some money or some bananas you have them with you but that's pretty much about it you know your job as a parent should not be much more than that you can observe and you should present those things to the coach so that he or she can then intervene and then help the student work on them are we there yes yeah, sir the next question how far should we choose a point to align yourself to the target um so i personally uh, in a in a let's say a driver shot on an iron shot i wouldn't like to choose anything further than 3 feet away from where my ball lies um on the contrary when i go into short game i could go even as less as 2 to 3 two feet or maybe even just ahead of the ball uh so a yard or so when it comes to ball striking and on short game i would actually go to you know just like a foot or two ahead of my ball to choose all right uh, sir is it advisable to walk with a child when he is playing any ig tournament or a serious tournament so it really depends on the kind of rapport that you have with your child whether your child looks at you as a support system or whether you you end up building some pressure onto the child and it is very very important aspect and let's uh, you will have to find that out for yourself whether your child feels under pressure with you around or do they actually feel uh, better with you around and there are both the cases i have seen both the cases uh, although the the latter one with the parent around be comfortable or far lesser but still there are some cases like that i would definitely say just leave them be for 4 or 5 hours and let them play and they'll figure their way out you know uh, at the end of the day how long are you going to travel with them for right you aren't going to travel with them when they turn pros how much will you travel with them so i would definitely say just leave them be on the golf course let them go out there and play and whether they play well or not doesn't matter let them just be all right uh, sir how would you recommend keeping the negative thoughts while playing a tournament round how to keep how to build that confidence in yourself okay so now this we have to go back into the first part of the way i started this uh, conversation with all of you uh, we have to go into mindfulness and awareness and we have to also go into practicing good habits uh, throughout our normal life so let's say habits like you know staying away from negative talk just generally you know does negative talk serve you or not you should stay away from it because your awareness should tell you that this sort of a thought process does not help me uh while playing with someone let's say that there are these different kinds of characters i have seen on a golf course and this especially happens on a junior tour or an amateur tour that uh, you know there are these pockets of players who would sit together after the round and they'll discuss their rounds and you know you will you will hear that oh my god what a bad luck dawned on top of me and how i uh, you know he disturbed me or she disturbed me and when we start indulging into all these kinds of things we are putting more into an external factor controlling our good shots and our bad shots than ourselves and we must hold ourselves accountable for pretty much everything that we do be it a good shot or a bad shot or a good round or a bad round and when that happens that is the time i think anyone will be able to take away all the negativity because once you realize that it is all dependent on you you will be able to shun off all these thoughts away from yourself uh 
All right, sir. We don't have any more questions regarding the lovely question right lovely. now. So, uh, just to you know, sort of uh, wrap this up. Uh, golf is a game where you know scoring is the most important thing, and uh, keeping yourself mentally calm at all times is very very important because even an eighteen hole round is not easy. It's a four and a half hour round with eighteen different holes with hundreds of different scenarios that appear in front of you as a player, and only if you can keep your mind at a calm level through and through. your judgment of how what kind of a shot you want to play is going to stay similar otherwise if you are in a state of anger you could make hasty decisions if you are in a state of complacency you could make stupid decisions so you should try to stay in a very calm and balanced state throughout your round of golf be it 18 holes or be it 4 days of golf and that will really help you in making the right decisions so if you duff a shot no problem just go there play it again if you missed a putt no problem go to it finish that putt okay and keep moving on like this and practice this for a few days uh once you practice this for a few days you will see how much you start improving because you stop beating yourself up for that bad shot that you hit and to sum all this up i would really say hit a shot and walk behind it find it again hit it again and learn from that experience and keep moving and keep moving on I hope this session helped you all. If anyone uh, on this session uh, wants any information or help from me later on, you can email me on Rahul Bajaj Golf at uh, gmail dot com, and I'll be more than happy to help you all. So thank you so much sure, for this sir. opportunity. Uh, I hope it helped you. Yeah, uh, it it did, uh, of course, sir. Thank you for doing the session with us, uh, sir. We just got a question right now from YouTube. would okay. you like to take that or uh, sure, sure, sure. all right so after this question we'll be ending the session okay. can you tell us something about how you developed your game in terms of technique uh, learned from coach or self uh, or peers so over the years i have uh, actually i when i started playing golf it was a lot of natural instincts uh, then after i got into coaching and i did improve significantly from some of the coaches and i did not do so well with some of the coaches uh, essentially i would say most of my coaches really helped me in getting better having said that uh, a lot of the stuff i learned was also by reading about ben hogan because there was a point of time that i had a little bit of struggle uh, of ball striking and after having a career where ball striking was my strength i didn't have that anymore and uh, going to coach after the other was only killing my confidence on a regular basis so what i did was i started reading uh, ben hogan's book which uh, basically every uh, if you see every technician of golf talks about ben hogan's golf swing so what i did was i i would read about what ben hogan himself used to say and whatever he used to say the next day i would put earphones in my head and go there and work on them and uh, that used to help me out significantly uh so yeah so i i i used to i i benefited from from both aspects from coaching and a lot of a lot of work on my own uh i would actually work on one lesson for days at end for hundreds of hundreds of golf balls uh before i felt like it was settled and i could move to the next level all right yeah. all right okay So let's close this down, and I hope some of you will uh, benefit from this stuff that we've spoken about today. So, like I've said earlier, if you all need any help later on, you are you know most welcome to come and ask me questions on Rahul Bajaj Golf at Gmail dot com. Thank you. Thank you.